Hello everybody, my name is Martin Jarrett and I'm a Senior Research Fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law. There are few concepts in international investment law that stir up controversy like legitimate expectations. For some people, it's an unruly horse that investors can ride to claim compensation merely because some state conduct causes a devaluation of their investments. And because of this conception, I've noticed that there's an effort underway in the jurisprudence to restrict legitimate expectations with this idea. If the investor foresees the state conduct that allegedly breaches its legitimate expectations before it makes its investment, then no breach can be established. Here's the spoiler alert. By the end of the video, I'll show you why, from the doctrinal standpoint, this restriction on legitimate expectations is wrong. That doesn't mean, however, that the investor's lack of due diligence is irrelevant in the determination of the state's international responsibility. It actually assumes relevance in another part of the calculus for international responsibility. And as regards where, I'll show you soon. For now, I want to dig into the idea that a lack of investor due diligence can defeat a claim based on legitimate expectations. Consider the case of Stadtwerke München and others versus Spain. Like all of the recent ECT-based investor versus Spain arbitrations, the claimants had investments in the renewable energy sector. For the electricity that these investments pumped into the grid, Spain paid the claimants tariffs. Accordingly, when Spain changed the tariff regime to effectively reduce the amount that it had to pay to investors like the claimant, it had a negative effect on the revenue that the claimant's investments could generate, and hence the claim for compensation filed by the claimants. All right. In this case, the claimants argued as follows. This change to the tariff regime defied our legitimate expectations. They argued that they legitimately expected that the original tariff regime would remain in effect during the operating lives of their investments. The problem for the claimants, however, was that the arbitral tribunal disagreed, albeit by a majority. Like the vast majority of arbitral tribunals coming out of investor treaty, sorry, investment treaty arbitrations, the majority arbitrators did not pinpoint one particular reason in their legal reasoning and, and say, this is the factor that determines our outcome. But it is apparent that the claimant's lack or apparent lack of due diligence was uppermost in the majority arbitrator's minds. Now, what's important here is a decision of the Spanish Supreme Court. In the relevant case, the Spanish Supreme Court held that the Spanish government's changes to another tariff regime, i.e. not the one that the claimants were operating under, was lawful or were lawful from a constitutional standpoint. After discussing this decision, the majority arbitrators held as follows, and I'm going to read here from the arbitral award. This Supreme Court judgment was a matter of public record at the time that the claimants invested in Spain. A reasonable and prudent investor would have known of this decision, understood its implications for a contemplated investment, and adjusted expectations accordingly. All right, translated, the claimants were on notice that Spain could change the tariff regime before they invested, so... When they did change the tariff regime, the claimants could not argue these changes breach our legitimate expectations. I'm going to get to my point quickly. Whether the investor should have seen it coming, this type of argument should have no bearing on the legitimacy of its expectations. Rather, the legitimacy of an expectation should rise or fall solely on account of another factor the objective meaning of the representations made by the state that induce the investor's expectations. So, if the investor looks at the state's representations and concludes that, for example, a certain tariff regime will stay in place during the operating life of its investment, 
And that conclusion accords with the objective meaning of those representations, then it is legitimate to expect that the original tariff regime will indeed stay in place. The issue whether the state will actually act in accordance with the objective meaning or whether the investor should have known about the state's likely future actions, i.e. that it would not act in accordance with the objective meaning, those are totally separate issues. To illustrate this point, consider the, the case of the unreliable parent. All right. This is the parent who frequently promises his or her child that he or she, for example, will attend a school play that the child is in, uh, will attend the, the child's soccer game, etc., but habitually fails to turn up. Is it wrong for the parent not to act on his or her undertakings, even in light of the fact that he or she has a history of not performing? Of course it is. Of course, it's still wrongful. The, the point is breaking promises, which is what happens when a state breaches an investor's legitimate expectations is presumptively wrongful, regardless of the promisee's knowledge about the likelihood of the promisor's actual performance. And because of the presumptive wrongfulness of promise breaching, the state's failure to act in accordance with the, with the investor's legitimate expectations should translate into international responsibility without regard to the investor's knowledge on the likelihood of such failure. All right then, so where does this leave the issue of the investor's lack of due diligence? In other words, the fact that it should have known better than to invest considering that it, the investor, had foresight that the state might act contrary to its legitimate expectations. Um, whenever we hear a should have known better argument, uh, you can perhaps think of a famous Richard Marx song, but you should also think of a well-known legal concept, contributory fault, otherwise known as contributory negligence, or in American law, comparative negligence. This is a topic I feel extremely comfortable talking about because I quite literally wrote a book on it. This one here, Contributory Fault and Investor Misconduct in Investment Arbitration. In the book, I explain obviously a number of things, but one thing that I, I really try to, to hammer home is that there are two forms of contributory fault in international investment law. I call them invest, investment mismanagement and investment reprisal. With cases of investment mismanagement, the investor negligently contributes to its loss by putting its investment in harm's way. Whereas with investment reprisal, the investor contributes to its loss by provoking the state's wrongful conduct against it. So thinking back to the facts of Stadtwerke München versus Spain, what form of contributory fault was potentially in play? Investment mismanagement. There was definitely no provocation on the part of the investors in, in all of those cases. The investor arguably mismanaged its investment by putting it into a position where it could be adversely affected by Spain's conduct. And it should have known about the likelihood of that conduct. Although I, I do want to stress that I don't want to make any conclusions on the question of was there investment mismanagement in this case or any other of the ECT cases involving Spain. The question I really want to get to is this one here. Why should we be so strict about the relevance of should have known better arguments? Does all of this doctrinal gymnastics actually make a difference? And the answer is very much yes. If the state breaches the investor's legitimate expectations, but the investor's conduct amounts to investment mismanagement, then the arbitral tribunal has to apportion the international responsibility between the investor and the state, as opposed to flatly saying to the investor, there is no international responsibility here. And the beauty of this approach is that it better accords with the common conceptions of responsibility. So for example, when a speeding car hits a pedestrian, which is the 
figurative equivalent of a state's unlawful conduct damaging an investment. The fact that the pedestrian noticed that the car was speeding but took the risk of crossing the road does not cure the car driver's speeding. It, it still remains unlawful. In, in these cases, the court, well, the courts apportion responsibility between the pedestrian and the car driver because they are both at fault. They're speeding on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have the pedestrian who takes an unnecessary risk of running in front of the speeding car. This is the approach that should be taken in investment treaty arbitrations as well, divvying up the responsibility where both parties are at fault. And if we follow this approach, then the next question is, according to what equation can international responsibility be fairly apportioned? That's a big issue and I need another video to cover it, but I, I should note that there is an equation in the book that I've written and it moves away from the model of arbitrary determinations towards a more objective approach to divvying up international responsibility. Um, for now, the main point is that there are dozens of ECT-based investor versus Spain arbitrations currently pending. To the arbitral tribunals presiding over those arbitrations, they are urged to adopt a two-step approach when the issue of the investor's lack of due diligence is in play. Number one, has the state breached the investor's legitimate expectations having regard to only the objective meaning of the state's representations? And two, should the investor have foreseen the state's breach at the time of making its investment? Now, by following this approach, we can get to outcomes that fairly share international responsibility in cases where both the investor and the state are at fault. And thank you very much for watching.